Hello, my name is Olivier Kreit, and I'm the Multimedia Lead at Collabora. I've been working on video calls for the last 15 years, first as the maintainer of a library called Farstream, which was used to do video calls using SIP and XMPP, and later with all kinds of other technologies. But in the last couple years, uh, just like everyone else doing video calls, I've really been concentrating on WebRTC. Uh, in this presentation, I will be telling you three things. First, what is WebRTC? I'm going to give a high-level introduction. Then I will go over the most popular open source implementations of WebRTC. And last, I will give you a couple of tips and tricks on when and why to use WebRTC and when not to use it and how to deploy it on embedded systems. So what is WebRTC? It's a low way to send low latency data audio and video in particular, uh, to browsers. Uh, it's really been designed by the browser makers for their own use. It is uh, designed for peer-to-peer -peer use, meaning that you can send the data without going through a server. Uh, it is composed of a JavaScript API that the browsers implement, as well as a set of IETF standard that define how the data is actually sent underneath. Uh, the JavaScript API in the browser is composed of, of really two main parts. First, there's the get user media uh, function, which allows the uh, JavaScript application in the browser to access the microphone and the camera in a secure way, meaning that the user has to approve it. Uh, this is completely offline, right? So it doesn't actually connect to the internet. It just accesses the data and you can then put it on the screen, for example. In addition to this API, there is the peer connection API. That is the actual API to connect to the other side, to establish the peer connection. And you can uh, connect it to the camera that you get it from the uh, get user media to create a complete uh, video calling solution in a browser. The way this API is designed is that it extracts all of the encoding, decoding, transmission. So if you're a web developer, you don't need to know any of this. Uh, so the rest of this presentation really is for people who want to understand how it works and uh, be able to implement it in embedded systems. So what are the component protocols at the uh, IETF level, at the lower layer? There are uh, dozens of RFCs involved, but the most important things that you have to know about is first the real-time protocol, the interactive community establishment protocol, ICE, and the security layer, which is DTLS. So what is RTP? RTP is a protocol to uh, send audio and video over the internet. It is widely used uh, with, with protocols like SIP, XMPP, RTSP, etc. Uh, it is designed to be sent over UDP because it is designed for low latency, but you can also send it over TCP as a fallback. And it's very simple actually, RTP. The RTP pa packet only has a 12-byte header. This 12 byte extra header has a couple uh, more uh, information points that the UDP header doesn't contain. First, it contains a flow identifier, allowing to multiplex multiple streams over the same uh, underlying transport. It has a sequence number, so every packet gets a number uh, that the sender uh, puts in, in sequential order, so that the receiver, by looking at these numbers, can put the packets back in the right order because UDP does not provide uh, ordering, and it can know if there was a gap, so if a packet was lost, and uh, take appropriate action. There's also a timestamp, so the sender just puts a timestamp uh, so that the uh, receiver can play back the packet in the same time sequence uh, that they were captured in. Uh, it has an infrared of media format so that the receiver can know what kind of media it's receiving, uh, this is particularly uh, useful so that you can switch the type of uh, media at runtime to the codec and things like that. Uh, and then it has a system to extend the header. So if this 12 byte header doesn't have all the information you need, you can add uh, some extensions. This is one of the things that uh, the WebRTC system does. It has a couple of things that it does uh, as a header extension. So what is ICE? 
ICE is a way to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection between two computers. Uh, the way it works is actually not very complicated. Each peer, so each agent, each site, uh, finds all the possible ways that it can be reached, all the possible addresses. So, for example, it can be the address on its local interface. Uh, if you have something like a telephone, it could have like a Wi-Fi and an LTE interface, so it actually have two addresses. Then it will try to get the address of any NAT box, either uh, by uh, using some uh, local protocol, such as UPnP, or by sending a packet to a server and saying, hey, server, where do you think this packet is coming from? And then we can maybe get the external IP address. Uh, it will collect all of these addresses and probably also the address of a relay to use as a fallback and send these using a uh, reliable mechanism to the other side. So now both sides have a list of these uh, addresses, uh, which we call candidates. Uh, the list of these addresses is uh, used by the implementation to take each local address and each remote address and pair them and then it's just going to try all of these network paths uh, in a specific order that is specified by the, by the process. Uh, and then it's basically trial and error, right? It will look at all the network paths and will try to pick the best one. Uh, and then once one of these is actually connected, you'll be able to send a request, receive a reply. Now we say that ICE has been connected and a connection has been established. And so now that we have a peer-to-peer -peer connection, the next uh, protocol on top of it is TLS, Datagram TLS to be particular. Uh, this TLS is the same protocol that is used for HTTPS. Uh, so it does almost exactly the same. It just adds two things to work over uh, UDP. So the first of it is a sequence number so that you can know which packet you're talking about since there could be gaps. And uh, there's a mechanism for retransmission. So if a request hasn't had a reply within a certain timeout, the request is resent and uh, the other side will reply again, right? So this uh, allows it to work over an uh, unreliable uh, lower layer protocol. What does TLS do, right? For those who are not familiar with it, what it does really is at first it uses certificates to establish a session between uh, both sides. And from this session, it negotiates a a temporary uh, session key. Uh, it generates a random session key and it exchanges it securely between both sides. Once this secure key has been uh, uh, transmitted, then this is what's used to actually send the, the data. Uh, in the case of RTP, we use something called secure RTP. So instead of encrypting the, the totality of the packet, uh, some bits of the RTP either are, are left unencrypted so that you can have a middle box that can forward it more or less intelligently without having to uh, decode the content. Uh, the way this works is that the session key from the TLS session is extracted and then it is fed into the SRTP stack. This is called the TLS SRTP. WebRTC has a couple other features that I'm not going to go into details, but there's a way to uh, retransmit audio video packets uh, that is used by the browsers. Uh, it supports forward error correction that is mostly useful when there are a lot of errors uh, which are not caused by congestion or when the latency of the link is quite high, for example, a satellite link. Uh, it also transmits information that enable bitrate adaptation. Um, WebRTC itself does not specify how to do bitrate adaptation, that's really left as an exercise to the reader, but appropriate information is transmitted and uh, different browsers have their own implementation of these algorithms. Uh, most actually use the code that comes straight from Google, from Chrome, but uh, other implementations do exist, other protocols exist. Um, then there's a data channel. So I talked about audio and video, but WebRTC also has a separate uh, way to send arbitrary data that is, can be sent like from the browser application. Uh, this data is sent as messages, uh, and these messages can have different levels of reliability. So it can go from full ordered reliability, such as uh, uh, you would get from TCP. You can have fully reliable, but not ordered. Uh, so it gets a, they can come in a different order. Uh, you can have partial reliability, where uh, if a packet doesn't arrive in time, it's retransmitted. 
uh, but up to a certain limit. So either a certain number of retransmission or a certain timeout. And then uh, you can just set it completely unreliable. So this is controlled by the, by the application. So I said uh, there was a relay server that's possible. So this is called Turn. Um, there exists a couple of open source implementation, but by far the most popular is called Turn. It's very scalable. Um, it doesn't take much resources from the computer. Um, in our experience, uh, we fill the, the bandwidth way before any other resource gets a problem, becomes a problem. Uh, so that is uh, the main kind of uh, agnostic server. So Turn doesn't know anything about the content, just forwards packets. There exist two other kinds of, of servers. Uh, the first one is pretty much the most popular. It's called a selective forwarding unit. Uh, it doesn't decode and encode the video. It just forwards the flows. Uh, so you, this is what is used, for example, by many of the online uh, video call platforms. Uh, one of the big advantages of this, obviously, is that you, it's cheaper on the server because they can receive a lot of flows and just forward some of them. Or, uh, like, if you ever call it a thousand participants, maybe it's just gonna forward you the flows of like five or ten participants, right? Uh, there exists a number of open source SFUs. Uh, the most popular one is probably Jitsi and Janus. Uh, there's also MediaSoup. So all of these three are uh, widely used and pretty reliable. Then there's something called a multi-conference unit. That is the more traditional video conferencing system. So uh, an MCU uh, will uh, receive the video, decode it, and then you can, for example, compose it, create a mosaic or something into a single image, and then send a single stream to each uh, client. Because the disadvantage of the previous system is that if you had multiple uh, streams that you want to see, like talking to multiple people, then you would actually receive multiple streams of the client. You have to, to decode separately, which requires more resources of the client. Uh, in an MCU, we move these resources to the server, which does the transcoding. Uh, the most popular open source one is probably FreeSwitch which was generally used as a telephony server, but it can also do video. And uh, there is something called Corento also, which is a Java-based framework to build um, um, media processing applications, in particular WebRTC MCUs. Now that I've talked about more the server side, if you want, uh, I'll talk about the endpoint. So the endpoint is what you actually have like with you, right? Uh, the most popular library by far is called LibWebRTC or just WebRTC. Uh, it's from Google. It's the code from Chrome, right? That is used in the Chrome browser, but was, that was also adopted by all the other browsers. So if you use Firefox, if you use Safari, uh, this is all the same code base. Uh, there's also Peon, which is pretty actively developed, which is in Go. Uh, and which is more a framework to develop WebRTC applications. Uh, it is. Uh, it doesn't do the encoding or the decoding, a bit like GStreamer does. Doesn't do that either in the WebRTC stack. Uh, and it it looks pretty decent. I haven't used it personally, but I only hear good things. Uh, there's also a library from Amazon from AWS called uh, the KVS WebRTC SDK. Um, I've only seen it used as a way to send video to the uh, KVS WebRTC service from Amazon. So uh, that's a bit of a special implementation. And then last but not least is GStreamer's implementation of WebRTC. It is based on GStreamer's mature RTP stack. Uh, GStreamer, for those who don't know, is a media framework to process audio and video information that is based on the concept of pipelines. Uh, pipelines are a, a graph of elements that process information one at a time. So you have the first element of the graph that captures information and then sends the next one which does something to the next one does something else all the way to the end of the graph. Uh, this makes it possible to mix and match different technologies together quite easily. Uh, one of the features is that we have uh, encoder and decoder elements, some of which are software-based, some of which are hardware-based, and which cover pretty much the entirety of what the industry can do. Uh, this means that if, when using GStreamer's WebRTC stack, that's also a separate element. So we can connect an existing encoder to the WebRTC stack without having to write any new code. 
uh, by its nature, as a separate element, it makes it easy to integrate it into an existing gesture based pipeline. But a uh, design choice that was made when creating the GStreamer WebRTC uh, element was to mimic the WebRTC uh, API from the browser, so the JavaScript API. And that creates the limitation that the uh, uh, this element cannot be used from the command line with Jesse launch. You actually need to write an application around it. Uh, this means that it's normally what you want in real life, but it means it's a bit harder to prototype. So to make prototyping easier, there is a element called WebRTC stack written in Rust that uh, has a web server included in a small application built in so that you can easily try the WebRTC just in element and even use it for simple uh, use cases. Um, WebRTC is great, but it's not for everyone. There are some cases where it's not the appropriate technology. Uh, the most evident normally is anything that requires large scalability. Uh, WebRTC is based on the idea of a one-to-one -one connection, uh, which means that it's difficult to implement caches and CDNs around it. Although some people have tried, uh, it, it's really hard to scale um, and costly to scale. Also, if you don't need low latency or peer-to-peer, -peer, maybe you just want to have, use something like low latency Dash or HLS. That gives you around one to two seconds of latency uh, at scale uh, that can go through a CDN and allow you to send video from a single source to a lot of recipients relatively cheaply. But if you need an latency that's under one second uh, and you want to send a video audio to a browser or receive video audio from a browser, WebRTC is for you. Uh, if you want to go peer to peer and skip any kind of servers, uh, WebRTC is for you, either for because you want to use a server cost or for privacy reasons. Another typical use case would be to replace uh, RTSP. So that's the protocol that's commonly used by security cameras. And it works really well if you're on a, over a local network, but it really uh, dates from 20 years ago. And it doesn't have the modern feature that WebRTC has. In particular, it doesn't have eyes to go through uh, NATs, it doesn't have retransmission normally, normally it's not deployed with any of the other modern technologies. So it's quite common now that people want to replace RTSP with WebRTC to be able to access a security camera remotely, uh, but with the low latency that you get with WebRTC. That said, WebRTC is great, but it has some performance requirements. Uh, even if you're not encoding, right, because encoding video normally takes quite a lot of, of processing power, but in an embedded system, normally you have a dedicated hardware encoder to do that. So it's not really relevant often. But what you, is relevant for RTC is that uh, encryption is required. You cannot avoid it. And it means that uh, either you need a processor that can process a yes uh, in real time. Uh, so if you use something like OpenSSL, it has really good uh, ARM assembly and it's quite fast. But for example, a Cortex A5 is too slow to do 1080p video, uh, to do HD video. So in this case, uh, you will need some kind of hardware accelerator. Um, if you have a modern Cortex, there is hardware accelerator built into the CPU. That is very fast. You've already won. But if you're using something older and they chose to build the TLS accelerator, or the AES accelerator as a separate IP block, Often that will not work for uh, WebRTC, uh, not because the hardware accelerator doesn't have the right AES variant, but because there's a setup cost using a actual accelerator. And since you have to encode every packet separately, uh, you, you just lose all of the benefits of the hardware accelerator. And the other thing that you have to be careful when using WebRTC is that it has a larger attack surface than traditional uh, uh, HTTP-based systems, for example. Uh, there's many different protocols. There's RTP, there's a video encoding, video decoding. There is the uh, bitrate adaptation stuff. There is uh, ICE. So there's many different protocols that could all potentially be an attack vector. 
So it's very important that any device that integrates WebRTC capability have a update mechanism and an update process that makes it relatively easy to uh, do uh, critical updates in a timely manner. So if it takes you like six months to deliver an update to your device, then WebRTC probably is not a good idea for you either. In addition to the security aspects, uh, browsers move very fast, right? Some of them are of a now on the four week release cycle. And that means that the alpha version is gonna be the final version in two months, right? So it means that any uh, system that depends on communication with the browsers or anything non-trivial with the browser needs to have a continuous integration against the alpha version of the major browsers for, for the, the system to, to keep on working. It means that when you find that the browser have changed in an incompatible way, you have about two months to uh, deliver updates to all of your devices out there. Otherwise, they won't be able to uh, work with modern browsers by the time this uh, update rolls out to everyone. So you need to update quickly. And my recommendation also would to update to the latest version of your WebRTC stack relatively regularly. So multiple times a year, perhaps. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful. Uh, I hope you learned something and uh, I will be available for questions on the, on the chat, I believe. Thank you very much.